Hello and welcome. My name is Kay Ross and I'm really excited about seeing you here today. Now this webinar will be looking at how to present without tears. Now this is a topic that's close to my heart. And when I was putting it together, I remembered back to my very first presentation. Now in those days, I was a nurse and I was working in an intensive care unit and one of the things I found that I was doing because I was one, what they would call one of the senior nurses was I was working a lot with the student nurses and also the less experienced staff and I was teaching them how to look after sick kids, how to use the ventilators etc. And I loved doing that so I thought oh okay I'm going to start teaching. So I went to the head of the school and said, I you know I want to start teaching and I'd love to do a presentation and she said, great, we're a bit short-handed. So she signed me up to do a two-hour presentation on, of all things, the history of nursing. Now, I knew very little. In fact, I knew nothing about the history of nursing. It had been many years since I'd done my two-hour class on it as a student back in when I was a student nurse. So I thought, okay, two hours on the history of nursing can't be too bad. So I prepared for it and I had a lot of information. Now back in those days we didn't have PowerPoint. We had what we called overhead projectors and we had transparencies. So I prepared about 160 transparencies because I wanted to make sure that I had everything that I could think of and that I had covered everything I could think of. So I had these 160 transparencies. Now for those of you who are old enough to remember transparencies, you had to write on them with overhead pens and so I used lots of colours and I had pictures and I had all sorts of information and my 160 transparencies already for my two hour session on the history of nursing. So I thought, okay, I'm ready. So a friend and I were walking down the corridor towards the classroom and as I got closer and closer, I could feel my heart bounding in my chest. I felt like I was going to be sick. I was so scared and I said to her, I said to my friend, I can still remember, her name's Jane. I said to Jane, I've changed my mind. I don't want to do this. I don't want to teach. I can't do it. Well, Jane being the caring, sharing person that she was, we got to the um, classroom door and it was one of those classrooms where the door was at the back of the room. So as I looked into the room, I could see 64 backs because everybody was sitting in their chairs, in their desks, facing forward and I was at the back of the room. So I could see the 64 backs of 64 student nurses and I thought, I, I can't do it. So I said to Jane, no, you do it, you do it here. And she said, no, okay, you've got to do it. So with that, she pushed me into a classroom and locked the door. So there, and as she locked the door, they all turned around and looked at me and I thought, oh, heck, what am I going to do? So my nerves had by this stage got even worse and I was sweaty. Remember I said I had overhead transparencies? Well, guess what? When there's sweat on them, they run. So I had these runny slides that made me feel even worse. And as I walked towards the front of the room, I dropped them. So there I am, 160 uh, transparent slides on the floor, 64 students looking at me wondering what on earth is this strange woman doing and I had them for two hours and I thought well it can't get much worse than this, can't get any worse than this. Well it actually did because once I scrabbled around for five minutes, pulled the slides up off the floor, tried to wipe the ones that didn't have too much sweat on and got the first one onto the um, overhead thing to turn it on, I turned it on and the bowl blew up. So I thought, okay, the universe is not being very supportive. So I thought, well, if I can survive this, I can survive anything. So I thought, well, what do I do? I've got no slides. I've got this lot for two hours. By now I've used up about 15 or 20 minutes of it because of all my fluffing around. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to tell them a story. Now, I don't know if you know about Florence Nightingale. I'm sure you've heard of her, but Florence Nightingale had 64 
women that she took from the poorhouse and she took them off to war. And I looked at this group and I thought, well, there's 64 of them. So I told them the story of Florence and we talked about what it would be like, because these were brand new students, if they were um, called up to go to a mass casualty and start nursing the people there. And we talked about the fact that there's no way they could do it, even if I was there to help them. And that was what Florence was like. We talked about the... So basically I sort of saved it, but they didn't get any of the information I was supposed to get. Luckily they didn't have an exam on the topic. And I've looked back on that quite a few times over the years and I've thought, you know, it doesn't have to be that bad. If I'd known a little bit then of what I know today about presenting, it would have been much easier. So that's why I do this. You know, over the last 20 or so years, I have developed a love of teaching and I especially love getting women in front of the classroom or the conference room or the webinar who've never done it before and who survive it and say afterwards, wow, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. That's what I love doing and that's why we're here today. Now this is a webinar, I'm going to go through some slides and then I am at the end going to talk a little bit about a program that we're starting in the next couple of weeks, otherwise why would we be doing a webinar? So it's going to be full of content that I know that you'll be able to use and we'll also have an opportunity at the end for those of you who would like some more tips and suggestions and support on getting in front of a room. So to do that, I need to show you some slides. So let me bring up the share screen. Now, this is the slide screen. Now, I want to talk about this before we go any further because this is what happened to somebody whose webinar I went to pre uh, not all that long ago when they showed a slide and I could see all the other slides down the side. So what the first thing I'm going to say is if you're going to show slides, know how to use it. So here I am, I'm going to bring up the slides and you should be able to see that slide there. So I'm going to look at some slides and talk about using slides and how to present. And as I said, the topic today is uh, present without tears and you can see me up in the corner and I'm not crying, which is also always good. So let's start. About me. I'm an Aussie, for those of you who haven't picked up on the accent yet, I live on the Gold Coast in sunny Queensland, which is on the East Coast, best place in the world to live. I have previously lived in the US in both Oregon and California for eight years, great experience. I love presenting, as I've talked about. Haven't always loved it, that first presentation was a doozy, but I learned from it, I survived it and I'm still here. My past background, I've been a nurse, an educator, a coach, counsellor, trainer, and I've spoken at international and national conferences. So that's a little bit about what I bring with me. Now, people have said to me, you were, you were a nurse and now you're a presenter and you do teaching and training. And I say, yep, nurses are really flexible. And one of the things about being a nurse is you learn how to talk to people. That's what saved me that day. With those students, I just talk to them. And I think for me that's the number one thing about presenting is that ability to talk to people and that's what I got from nursing. Got a lot of other things well as well, which includes, you know, not panicking. Well, I try not to panic. Being um, organised, being flexible, all those things have been really useful for me as a speaker and a trainer. So enough about me. The question I want to ask you is what stops you from presenting? And I'm sure whatever that is, is what's brought you to this presentation today. Now I ask this question to um, a couple of groups of business women and I got lots of information back. It seems like I hit a sore point with a lot of people because a lot of people said, I wish I could present, but 
So I started looking at what some of these women were telling me. And Alison, she talked about she has a fear that someone in the audience will know more than me. Now that's a real fear. And what I would say to Alison is the way to deal with that fear is to make sure you plan and that you do research. Now I'm never ever going to be able to guarantee to anybody, including Alison, that there's not going to be somebody in the audience that knows more than she does. However, I can guarantee that the more that you plan and the more that you feel prepared, the more that it actually doesn't matter all that much if somebody happens to know more than you on that particular topic. And I know for me, I sometimes I think about this and then I tell myself, okay, look, I've done the work for this. I know that I know a lot about this particular topic and for me, if I didn't know a lot about it, I wouldn't be doing it. That's what gets me up in front of the audience. And so I'd say to Alison, do your best, prepare, learn about and make sure you do know about the topic and then just get up there and do it. The other thing I will say to Alison and everybody else is if somebody asks you a question that you don't know the answer to, be honest. Don't try and fudge it. If if somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer and you try sort of to give, you know, a bit of an answer and you're not sure but you waffle on for five minutes like a politician, they're going to know it. And the other thing is they're not going to trust you. If instead you said, wow, that's a really good question, I'm not sure about that one, does anybody else know the answer to that? And you can guarantee that pretty much somebody in the audience will be able to say something. If not, say, well, look, that's something that um, I'll have to do some research on. So what I'll do is I'll find the answer and I'll get back to you. Great question. Thank you. And we all learn from that. So never, ever fudge. If somebody asks you a question you don't know the answer to, be honest. Ask your audience if anybody else knows the answer. And if not, be honest again and say, okay, I'll have to find the answer to that one and I'll get back to you. So um, another fear that quite often people talk about is that they're going to forget everything. Isabel actually said her fear was, I'm going to forget everything, including my own story. And I understand that. When you're nervous, it's almost like everything just drains out of you and you're left there standing with nothing in your brain at all. So to, Alice, to Isabel, I'd say, have some cue cards. And on the cards, just a couple of dot points with a couple of words on them. So that if you do forget everything, you know you've got your cue cards. And I know for me, those cue cards are a lifesaver. I still use them. So having them there actually gives me the confidence to start. And most times I haven't needed them, but if I do need them, there they are. Jean, she says what stops her from presenting is her nerves and her throat closing up. Now, we'll all have different physical reactions to being nervous. I talked about when I was nervous doing that presentation with those student nurses, I felt like I was going to vomit. With Jean, her throat closes up. With somebody else, they feel like they've got butterflies in their chest or they're going to have a heart attack or they just want to go to the toilet. Whatever it is, is because of all that adrenaline jumping through your veins. What I would say to Jean and to other people who do have those sort of reactions is what we'll do is we'll have some breathing exercises for you to do before you start and also have a glass of water with you because if you're feeling nervous, you can just say, I'm just going to have a sip of water and that gives you time to gather your thoughts. It also gives you something different to concentrate on. And the other thing I've done, and I've found that it works really well, is that I'll say to the audience, the first time I spoke at a conference, and this was at a conference and there's, you know, five or 600 people there looking at me, I said, I'm a bit nervous. And when I'm nervous, I talk fast. So if I'm going too fast for you, please just let me know and I'll slow down. 
And they sort of giggled a bit, but it took the tension off because guess what? Most times the audience wants you to do well. They, they're on your side and they're thinking, I'm glad it's not me up there, I'm glad it's them. So be honest. If you're nervous, breathe, have a sip of water, take a breath and you can keep going. Jess says she has a paralysing fear and she's scared that if she gets up in, in front of somebody, she's just going to freeze. What I would suggest with Jess and with other people who are, have this paralysing fear is to practise. Practise first in front of a mirror. Practise in front of just one person, your best friend. Practise in front of two people. Start off with just two or three minutes and work up to 10 minutes and then 20 minutes. Do your breathing exercises. Make sure you've done your research. Have your cue cards there. All those things will work. And that's how you get through that. It's going to stay a paralysing fear until you do it. And quite often what I've found is that the fear is always worse than the reality. As I said, most times the audience is, is on your side. They want you to do well. And so when we're doing this, practice, plan, use your friends, Practice again and just do it. Erin, she talks about getting terrible nerves. So I would say along with Jess and Alison, practice those breathing exercises, have a glass of water, have some sips, take some deep breaths, look ahead, have your cue cards ready and it'll work. Jen is afraid of not really knowing her stuff. That's where cue cards come in really handy. You don't need 160 slides like I did for my two hour presentation. If I'd known about cue cards, they would have been much easier. Mia, she has doubt and fear and her doubt and fear is about making a fool of herself. I tell you what, I have found time and time again that the fear is worse than the reality. The other thing, again, is to practice and to plan, to have your information, to have your research and just do it. Marie, she talked about terror. She just said, terror, I'm just absolutely terrified of getting up in front of an audience. So with Marie, again, let's do the breathing exercises, let's do the practice and plan. There's no such thing as too much planning. I'd say to people you need to plan, then plan again and plan some more. Negative mindset from Jamie. So Jamie's negative mindset is what stopped her from even thinking about doing a presentation. So what we need to do with Jamie is to look at that negative mindset, find out what it's saying to her and turn it around. Fiona, nerves. Norma. Now, Norma's was a bit interesting. Hers was fear of success. Now, that um, could also come in with that mindset stuff. So where has that fear of success come from? What does that mean for you? What would, it, what would happen if you were successful? Those are the questions we'd ask with Norma. We'd work on those. And once we start addressing those fears of success, then we'll find that she's got a door open for um, doing her presentations. Lacey overthinks and gets nervous about everything. And Kirsten is not knowing how to do the content. Now this is a common one. Now remember I said that I had 160 slides. Um, that's way too much. And on those slides, they were absolutely chock-a-block full of content. I had so much content. There's absolutely no way on this earth that I could have got through them even if I hadn't have dropped them and smudged them and everything else. So with Kirsten, I'd say, okay, let's look at the content. What is your topic? Let's break it down into all the things that um, people need to know about that particular co uh, topic. And then we'll put that into three categories, things that they absolutely have to know, things that they should know, and things that um, are just nice to know. And really focus on what they absolutely have to know and then have the nice to know and need to know um, as backups. So 
when we think about all those fears that we've just looked at, it means that people stop themselves pr from presenting on a regular basis. And that can stop people from going forward in their business. When you look at what, so I'll just go back and see, what some of those fears are, if people have got these fears about presenting, they'll also have them about other areas in their business. And this is what's going to stop them from going forward. So if we can start dealing with some of these fears, we'll find that it's not just the area of presenting that's going to be um, impacted, it will also be other areas in business as well. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. So when we're putting together a presentation, sometimes it's something you've been told to do, like I was told to um, do a presentation on the history of nursing. I would not have chosen that. Other times it's going to be things that you've decided to do, like for me, for example, today, I have decided, nobody told me to do it or asked me to do it, I decided to put together this presentation on presenting without tears. So the first thing you need to do is to come up with what do you want to present on. For me it was fairly easy because I love presenting on presenting. Now what you're presenting and what you're putting together could be for a workshop, a meeting, a conference, a staff in service or education, a webinar, training, com uh, said conference, etc. Facebook Live, YouTube, doesn't matter. We've got two main ways of doing it these days. We've got online like we're doing at the moment and we've also got face to face where you might be running a workshop or a training. Doesn't really matter in some ways which one it is because the basics are going to be the same. So the next thing you need to do is to write down the title before you go any further. So you've got a pen and paper there, write down the title of the session that you want to do. Once you've done that, then we go on to the next step. And the next step is to ask yourself three questions. And once we've answered these three questions, you'll find that you've got a lot of information now to put your um, presentation together. So the three questions are, what outcomes do I want participants to finish with? So if I thought about this presentation today, the outcome that I would like people to have at the end is to have some more knowledge and skills about putting together a slide presentation. I would also like them to know some strategies of how to deal with nerves and some ideas about how to put the whole presentation together. Next question, what teaching and learning activities will I use? Now these can be different depending on whether you're face to face or online. Now if um, you're online at the moment and you're listening to me live, then you can put some questions in the question box. If you're looking at the um, recording, then you can uh, put questions into an email, send them to me and I'll go back to you. That's a teaching and learning activity. How will I check for understanding? Looking at the questions that are coming up, looking at the answers that come up as well. So participants learning, what I like to do is to think about how a participant's going to learn. Now in this particular way when I'm doing a webinar, it's mostly going to be by watching, listening and hopefully writing some notes. If I was doing this live in a workshop, it could be also interaction with other participants, um, asking questions, doing some small group work, etc. The teaching and learning activities, again, they can be via the computer, answering questions, um, coming to, up with some ideas, doing a brainstorm. If it was in a workshop, then uh, probably a lot more small group activities. If it was in a conference, it might be turn to the person next to you and ask them and give them a, a question to ask each other. Checking for understanding. Now if I was live, I would be asking questions and also I would be answering the questions that came up. That's how I would check that they understand what I'm talking about. For something like this, it comes back to 
people giving me feedback at the end, asking questions, making comments, and that gives me an evaluation. It lets me know whether people got it or didn't get it. So I want to spend some time on looking at putting slides together. Now remember at the beginning I showed you the difference between the presenter view and the non-presenter view of having slides. Now I happen to use PowerPoint. There are other slide um, software out there. They all have various different, you know, small differences. However, they are all got the same aim, which is to be able to develop slides to um, do presentations. Now, when you look at this slide, what's your reaction? My reaction, if I was in the audience and I looked at this slide, I'd think, boring. All we've got is some black letters on a white board. And I have actually been to presentations, and some of them have been for an hour, where the slides were very similar to this one. And all that is telling me is that the person who put the slides together either didn't care less, didn't know what they were doing, didn't realise that there are other ways of putting a slide together, or did it at the last moment and didn't have time to do it properly. Any of those are not good. For me, if I was in the audience and I had to sit through a slide presentation and they look like this, I would not be impressed. I'd be really having trouble staying awake because, as I said, I, I personally find it boring. So if that was your slide, what was your reaction to this slide? And I know past participants have used the word boring a lot and couldn't care less and hurried and whatever. It doesn't really matter, but the reality is you need to do better than just having words on a plain slide. So instead of um, that, you could have something like this. Now with this one, I've actually faded out a picture in the background and then got the title quite large in the middle so you can see it. And for those people who would like more information on how to put together slides like this, I'll be covering that in another program. So we can do that then, but it is very easy. Now one of the downsides of me doing this is that I've actually had people then start critiquing my slides and they've said things to me, but Kay, you said in your slide thing that you shouldn't do this or you should do that, and that's right. So what I guess I'm trying to do here is to give you some guidelines. Take the ones that work for you. Not all of them will. What I always try and do is make sure that the slides that I develop are easy to read, they contain the information that I want them to contain, that they don't have too much information on them. So that's what I'm doing and that's what I'll be talking about in this presentation. So as you can see, all I've got on there is what the topic is and I've spent a couple of minutes talking about it. Okay, what's your reaction to this one? All I've got, you know, it's clear. However, colour is an, a really important thing to be aware of. When you see red, we have a reaction to it. For some people, it gets them angry. I don't particularly feel angry, but I feel overwhelmed. I just can't look at it straight on because it is too bright. But information is important. Each line in the slide should contain less than five words and you should have um, space in between each line. The other thing I would say also is, is that only have up to five lines on a slide. Any more than that, take, cut it back and or make a second slide. Be aware of the colour. As I said, this bright red is way too much for 99.9% .9 of the population. So two or more simple slides are better than one complicated slide. So if there's too much information, put half of it on a second slide. Each slide should illustrate a single point or idea. What do you think I'm trying to illustrate here? Any ideas? 
You're right. Yes, what I'm illustrating is light writing on a light background doesn't work. Um, I've used large and legible letters, but it still makes it difficult to read. So instead, we should have light writing on a dark background. Now, I'm not necessarily um, a fan of this purple whatever it is, but at least I can see the yellow much easier than I could here. Okay, look at the difference there and there. I personally would not use this background. It's not my um, choice, but it's one that's available. It's a little bit too busy for me, but some people like it. It's going to be a personal choice. Don't crowd the slide. I've already talked about making sure that each line is less than five words and less than five lines on a um, slide. Use solid colours instead of patterns and charts and graphs and use simple tables to present numbers. So, for example, oh, yeah, okay. Wasn't that clever? We had some animation. Animation I do like. I like bringing in lines one at a time and you've seen me do that a couple of times already. However, that, what I just did there, all that does is, number one, confuse you. You can't read it while it's swinging around. And the only other thing it does is show you how clever I am. Other thing I'll say about this particular slide is there's no, isn't, what's the point of having red and black? We don't need it. I would stick with the one colour and I would have some sort of background on that. This one's too crowded and it's too busy and it's overwhelming. The 3D... Um, makes it really hard to understand and we've got you know the checks we've got the stripes we've got the red and we've got that greeny blue it's way too much happening there it is much better to just talk about the numbers so instead of having all this we could say that um, you know we've got 20 sales here in the first quarter of hats and we had 30 sales of red jackets, et cetera, whatever it is. And as you can see, this um, got better in the second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, but it's just too overwhelming. Let's make life simple and don't um, use all those pattern fields. Now, this has got some interesting information on it. I'm not going to read it to you, but I have been to presentations where somebody will stand there and they will read this word for word. Now, there's a couple of problems with that is, number one, I've got way too much information. It's not big enough. People up the back will not be able to read it. And the other thing I will say is it's got nothing to do with this picture. So why on earth have we got a picture of a woman cooking sausages over a campfire? I've got no idea. I do love pictures. I use illustrations a lot. However, they need to have something to do with what the topic is. You don't stick a picture in just for the sake of it. And when you're um, putting your information in, stick to the five words per line, five lines per slide. and by doing that, you can have your um, letters quite large, at least 36 point. Any smaller and people at the back won't be able to read it. Any smaller and people who are watching this who have, you know, maybe a little bit older and need glasses, they need, you know, at least 36 point. Keeping it at 36 point also encourages you not to have too much stuff on it. So the problem with this slide, too much writing, and the picture's got nothing to do with what the topic is. So this one needs to be absolutely redone again. Again, I've got way too much information here. So it's, um, I think, 13 or 14 points, too many, and I could stand here and, or sit here and read them to you. I'm not going to, but don't do it. It's too much. And the thing that happens is every time... I bought this up and most of you are probably still reading it. I will give you this um, in a handout if you would like it, but the fact that you're reading it means you're not taking any notice of what I'm talking about and that is 
probably not a good idea. So keep it simple, keep it short, and if you need to, put it into two or three different slides. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about pictures here. Now, we've got a picture of a guy falling asleep. So you've all seen that, and then I can bring up that did you know that 92% of people will fall asleep during a boring presentation? This happens whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. It's up to the presenter to ensure that their materials keep everyone awake and you don't want to be known as a sleep-inducing presenter. Okay, that information's pretty good. But did I really have to have it all written down? Did I have to read it out to you? And the answer is no. So instead, instead of having all this information here, let the picture tell the story. It's a, it's a good picture. So instead, I could have it as a large picture and then I could start talking about it. And I could say to you, did you know that during a, a, a boring presentation, at least 92% of people will fall asleep? It's your job as a presenter to make sure that doesn't happen by having an engaging presentation that keeps people awake. Much easier. You will remember this 92%. You will remember this guy asleep at the keyboard. You won't remember all that information that I read to you from the previous one. Okay, pretty picture here. What have we got to say about it? I'm saying limit transi transitions and um, anima animation. I didn't need to bring this in one letter at a time. It's confusing, it's distracting, and it takes away from the message. I also don't need to have that swinging round and running around the slide. All that does again is tell you how clever I am at using animation. So unless I, I actually have used something similar to this when I had a bouncing ball, I can't remember what the topic was, and I had the ball bouncing around, because of course balls do bounce around. But even though this guy's fallen asleep at this guy's presentation, doesn't um, give me permission to have it bouncing around the slide and give, giving you all um, a headache. I want to remind us to use colour well. I've already talked about light on light and dark on dark doesn't work. So we want um, dark colours on a light background. That's my particular preference. If you like dark backgrounds and have a light colour. Red is not a good colour to use on a, all the time. It can be good for highlighting. Colour evokes feelings. Now, I can tell you it took me ages to do this because I had to do each colour at a time. It's not worth it. And what the, what is the point? So unless I was talking about Joseph's Technicolor coat or quilts or something and each colour has a different feeling or something I don't know, we don't need it. I should just stick to the one colour. Colour is emotional, so be aware of how you are using colour. And the right colour can help persuade and motivate. So that, you know, purpley pink colour looks pretty good on the light background. Again, yellow is not good. Studies show that colour can increase interest and improve learning. However, the yellow and the white will not do that. Now, I also wanted to spend a couple of minutes just talking about fonts. Fonts is the um, type of... Um, Gee, what's a good definition of a font? A font is what the letters look like. How's that? So serif fonts, serif means it's got curves. So serif fonts were designed to be used in documents. Now, if I had my whole PowerPoint in this, it would be really difficult to read. We should avoid changing fonts. I've actually stuck to the one font throughout and the font that I, I'll tell you what one it is in a minute. Serif fonts can be difficult to read, as I've said, and don't try to be too fancy because these ones, especially um, for people with poorer eyesight or up the back, will not be able to read them. So serif fonts are for documents. They are not for presentations. So avoid any of the fonts with these curves and swirls. So we need to keep it simple. So we want what we call a sans serif font. Sans means without. 
So it's without the curves and twirls. And the ones that are there, are, these are generally best for PowerPoint presentations, uh, especially when you've got a fair amount of text. There's Arial, Arial Black, Calibri. Now Calibri is what I use and I prefer just because it's a nice clean font. And Vedana. They're the ones I would suggest that you use. Whichever one you use doesn't really matter. Um, I prefer Calibri, but Vedana and Arial is also fine. They're sans serif, so they're without the twirls and the swirls, and that does make them much easier to read. As I said earlier, make sure they're at least 36 points so that people at the back can read, or people when you're online with a poor eyesight can also read it. So just to recap what I've talked about with slides, with the slides you do want to make a good impression, which means you do need to know how to use the slides, how to use the projector or whatever it is you're using online. It means that you need to keep the slides clean and simple so that people can read them. If you're using illustrations and pictures, they need to go with the content. Don't put a picture in just for the sake of putting a picture in. Whatever you do and however you use it will give people a lasting impression. And if you want the impression to be a good one, it does mean you need to put some time and effort into putting this together. So when you think about the impression that you're making on people, for most of us we want to be professional and engaging. So we can still be casual, we don't have to turn up in a power suit if we're doing a webinar. Some people, if you're comfortable then yes, okay. I personally don't even own a power suit, that's not who I am. So part of this is being who you are and if you're a little bit more casual then that's okay but you can be casual and professional at the same time. Always check for spelling, check your grammar, and double check and triple check your slides before using. There is nothing worse than having a slide come up and you look at it and you say, oh, sorry, I've got a spelling mistake there. If you're not sure, get a colleague or a friend to double check for you. Don't rely on the spell check because the spell check just checks words and you could have the wrong word in there. Ensure you know the technology, as I pointed out at the beginning with the slides. Make sure you know how to put it on slide, uh, presentation view. And if you don't know, then ask somebody. Lesson plans are a good idea. When I first started putting presentations together, I thought they'd be a waste of time. I now love them because they have um, saved my backside a couple of times by reminding me of what I'm doing and how I'm doing it especially when things don't go according to plan. So when you're putting a lesson plan together, think about how you're going to introduce yourself and what you're going to be talking about. Think about the content, your conclusion, and your lesson plan should include activities, any breakouts, questions and answers. I always have extra questions to ask at the end if I have extra time at the end. So the lesson plan should only be dot point, one piece of paper, and I do have a hard copy, whether I'm doing an online or a face-to-face -face presentation, I have an online copy of my lesson plan, I have a watch next to it, and that helps keep me on track. Great presenters need to be able to be flexible, provide quality and timely feedback to the people that they're talking to and if they've been asked for it. Provide critical and sometimes negative feedback to people if you've been asked to um, do something and it hasn't worked out well, then you need to be able to tell them that. And you need to be able to exercise control of the learning situation. So you need to know what you're doing and what to do if um, things don't go according to plan. The other big thing is you need to be an effective communicator. You need to be able to talk. You need to have a voice that goes up and down and is fluid, that's easy to look, uh, listen to. And you need to be able to also take feedback from your audience. So if you can see your audience, notice what they're doing, how they're reacting to what you're saying. 
If you're doing it online, keep an eye on the comments that are coming through because that will also give you a lot of information about how well you are communicating. You also need to be credible. Now, remember at the beginning, I talked about my story of doing the history of nursing presentation, but I also talked about the fact that I've been presenting for many years and that I have been teaching other people how to present. What I was doing was establishing my credibility. That's really important because if you want people to take notice of you, they need to know that you know what you're talking about. Now, I've done sessions that for the first time, but I've always been able to talk about how I have used that information in previous situations. So, for example, the first time I got up to teach people how to present, I talked about the fact that I'd been presenting for many years and was now using what I'd learnt as a presenter to, to teach others to present. So as I said, you need to establish your credibility. Know your audience. Find out as much about your audience as you can beforehand. Who are they, where have they come from and what are their expectations? You need to look the part, as I've said. You need to be professional. Doesn't mean you don't, can't be a little bit casual at the same time. Know what you're talking about and be IT savvy. If you don't know how to work the IT, then find out beforehand. Make sure you use updated materials. There's nothing worse than somebody talking to you about stuff that's 10 years old. So you need to stay abreast of new developments in your area of expertise. Now this is especially important for people who do the same presentation um, over and over. So if you're presenting material that you've presented previously, you don't just walk in with what you've done before, you walk in with an updated version of what you've done before. So stay abreast of what's happening in the world and make sure that you do update your presentations to keep up to date. Now one of my um, pet peeves with presenting is time with people who either go too fast or too slow. So one way around that um, is to Ask yourself, how much time do I have? Put aside probably five minutes for the introduction and five minutes for the conclusion. Allow five to ten minutes for questions and then look at how much time is left and that's going to be the body of your content. So depending on how much time you've got left, you need to break it into segments and thinking about how you're going to capture and engage your audience. So it might look something like this. Uh, your intro would be around five minutes, the body 40 minutes, and in that 40 minutes you've got a 10 minute discussion, video, you might have a video to show for five minutes. Do some small group work for five minutes, so we're up to 20. Maybe a role play for 10 minutes, brainstorm for 10 minutes, and there's your 40 minutes. Conclusion for five minutes, so there's your 50 minutes and then you've got five to 10 minutes for questions. Always have a backup plan. Now, I learned that I was asked to speak at a conference and I think I was the second or third speaker of the day and I was given my topic and I looked at the topics before and after me so I had an idea of what other people were going to cover. So I rolled up for my hours presentation and I got up and I said, you know, hi, my name's Kay Ross, etc., 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 and today I'm going to be talking about and talked about that, told them what the topic was. And they immediately said, oh, well, the person before you has already talked about that. And I went, oh, and before I had a major panic, which is what I felt like doing, I thought, okay, take a deep breath and what can we do? So I said to the group, luckily it wasn't a huge group, I said, okay, so what did they talk about? What did they cover? So they gave me um, an overview of what they talked about. So I said, okay, and I'm thinking, okay, there's a couple of things I was going to do as well. So I said, 
So if I then start with this, this and this, is that okay? And they said yes. And I thought, phew, thank heaven. So I had three or four points that this other person had not covered and I ended up expanding on those by asking them questions about them, asking them what their experiences are, etc. And I managed to wing it for that hour. So the backup plan, I hadn't thought about it beforehand, but luckily I was able to wing it and get through that hour's presentation. What I tend to do when I'm going to do a presentation is have a backup plan in place. So it might be think about what I could do if I had extra time. This also happened once when I was down to do, I think, a 40-minute session. And just before I started, they came up to me and said, oh, look, we just heard that the person after you can't make it. Are you able to continue and do 80 minutes instead of 40? And I said, okay. And again, I was able to use my backup information that I put there just in case I, I had extra time, didn't know I'd need an extra 40 minutes, but somehow we got through it. So things that you can have in your backup plan are questions, uh, small group work, videos, brainstorming, and I also write all those down on my lesson plan. Now questions are a really good one. I always have five to ten questions written down so that if I have extra time, I can ask the group what those questions are. If I have a lot of extra time, I can put them into small groups and ask them what they and ask them to address those questions in the small group. I always have a checklist, so I might have on the checklist um, if I'm doing a live presentation face to face, I might have the presentation on a USB that I've got with me, but I've also got it in Dropbox and I've got it in Google Docs so that I've got access to it. I also always have a hard copy of the slides so that if something happens then I can at least have the hard copy to refer to and I have had to do that. I went to um, a workshop once and they had, um, I can't remember what it was, the internet wasn't working, their IT wasn't working, nothing was working and literally I was left with my hard copy and so I said to the group, okay, look, I'll send you a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is talk to you about what I was going to do, use the whiteboard. I always have whiteboard markers with me, by the way. And I was able to jot down some of the main points on the whiteboard, ask some questions and got through the session without a PowerPoint. Now, I said at the beginning that I had a new program coming up and what it is is a foundation program which means I haven't run this particular program before and so because I haven't run it before, I've done presentations as I've said before, I've taught people how to present before but I haven't done it in this format. So it's a brand new program called Present Without Peers. So announcing the foundation program Presenting without tears means that you'll get a good deal on it. So what's in it? It's a um, for people on the webinar who watch the webinar, I've got 50% off the foundation program. So it's a small group of 6 to 12 people will be meeting online via Facebook. It runs over six weeks. During that six weeks, we'll have three live online trainings. So I'll be there and I'll present at the live training. We'll also have three hot seat coaching Q&A sessions and they'll be on the off weeks. Well, each person will get two one-on-one -on -one coaching from me. One of those sessions will be on whatever you want to be coached on and the other one will be uh, feedback on a presentation that you do. There will also be handouts, there will be a closed Facebook group and I will be in that Facebook group every day to do some quick Facebook lives, talk about what's happening, answer questions, check up on people. And as I said, you'll also get individual feedback. So basically, you're getting a six-week program. You will be expected to be putting in three to four hours each week of the program to be able to get the full benefits. If you fall behind, there's no problem really because you'll have access to that Facebook group 
for at least six months after the program finishes. So what is this going to cost? Before we look at the cost, I want to look at what people will get, what the outcomes of doing the program are. First one is that you'll get a good night's sleep before you have to present. The second thing is you'll get quick and easy on the spot strategies to deal with pre-presentation jitters. You'll develop confidence with developing a killer presentation. You'll know how to deal with any hiccups that happen while you're doing a presentation. You'll have a cheat sheet ready to check off for each presentation that you do. And you'll also, as I said, get personal feedback, including support and strategies for going forward after the course. So to get all that, and that's a lot, you, it's a one-time payment of $597, which works out to be less than $100 a week. And the usual price is going to be at least $1,200. If you prefer a payment plan, we do have that. It's three payments of $220 deposit followed by two fortnightly payments of $220 due on weeks two and 12, and that makes a total of 660. So for those who can pay up front one payment, you do save some money at 597. Otherwise, a payment plan brings it to 660. It's a jam-packed six weeks. I'm really looking forward to it because it gives me the opportunity to work really closely with just a small group and we can address anything that comes up in terms of your presentations and what you're doing and how you're doing it. There are some add-ons for people who want this and this can be um, as part of the program or afterwards. You can get one-on-one -on -one support before and during a face-to-face -face or online presentation. So if one of you say to me, look, you know, I've got a presentation coming up and I just need somebody to hold my hand from the beginning right through to the end, say absolutely, we can do that. I'll look at what your needs are and then develop a uh, project plan for you with uh, the price will be based on how much you need. Optional additions at any time is um, I can have a look at your materials before you start your presentation. So if you present, I'd need at least one to two weeks prior to when your presentation is going to be happening. Give you some feedback and you can take those on board and we can make sure that your presentation is up to scratch. Um, I can help with developing content, development of uh, PowerPoint slides, including if you want a branding on them. I can do a run through of your presentation with you and give you feedback before you give it. And I can also attend your presentation if it's somewhere in Australia and be there to hold your hand before and after the presentation and again give you feedback. So there's some of the upgrades that you can get as part of um, this program. So the program starts on Monday the 18th of June. Uh, the times will be um, de will be posted after I know the time zones of everybody. So what I'll do is, if I've got people from different time zones, I'll make sure that at least everybody gets two opportunities to attend live at a time that's really good for them. So that I'm not expecting everybody to get up at 1 a.m. if they don't happen to be in my time zone. So times will be negotiated for the live calls after we start, but the program starts on Monday the 18th of June. The webinar bonus, that is the 597, is available until 5 o'clock on Monday the 11th of June. If you're interested, if you've got any uh, feedback or questions or you want to know more about the program, then please email me, kay at krossviews.com. If you're ready to register, let me know and I will send you an invoice and also an invitation to the closed Facebook group. You can also PM me on Facebook. So basically, six-week program starts on Monday the 18th of June. The bonus is available until the 11th of June, $597 Australian as a one-up payment, you want a payment plan that's three payments of $220. So it's a good value and as I said, it'll be at least twice that after the foundation program. 
So I hope you found this useful. Um, we've covered a lot of information today. It gives you an idea of some of the information that we'll also be covering in the um, Present Without Tears program. So as I said, my name's Kay Ross. My email, kay at krossbiz.com. You can also look at my website, krossbiz.com. Please, any questions, feedback, comments, let me know. And I look forward to um, see if that works. Talking to you soon. Thanks very much and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.